out of the water. I'm uh, from the uh, turtle clan of the Mohawk people in uh, upstate New York and uh, Ontario, Canada. And um, I first want to thank the, um, Ethan for inviting me here today and for everyone here at the Collected Works Bookstore for um, hosting these wonderful events. Um, I'd also like to start off with a little um, seed blessing song. Um, it's something that we do every spring when we start our planting season, and I'd also like to uh, sing it in honor of the farmer who just lost his life, which I just found out about a few minutes ago, and he's probably a neighbor of mine. So. And those words mean uh, we are all traveling on this earth and planting our seeds. How many people here recognize these faces on the screen? Every one of them? It's kind of hard to talk with this microphone. Yeah, these are all uh, people, uh, indigenous and not indigenous, who have um, devoted their lives to making change on this earth. Um, and we're going to have, that's what the talk is going to be about today, so... Um, I'm going to give you a moment to read this slide. Uh, one word that uh, most indigenous people really um, dislike is the word civilized or civilization, and this is the reason why. Um, and this is just a quote. Uh, everybody know John Trudell or have heard of John Trudell from the Wounded Knee um, conflict back in the 70s. Uh, this quote uh, I ask you to keep in mind when you are um, fighting for your struggles or speaking out for your people or your beliefs is that this is what we're all dealing with at some level. Okay, so here's some maybe activists that you don't recognize and maybe a few that you do. Um, is there anybody here from the FBI today? <laughs> I'm just asking because I want to know what I'm doing after this event. Okay. Uh, I just spent the last uh, three or four weeks um, in January and early February traveling around with, um, I don't know how this, this man up here, Percy Smizer. Anybody know him? He's devoted the last 10 or 12 years to fighting against Monsanto. Um, he uh, ne was never his intention. He was a canola farmer in Canada, just minding his own business, doing research and providing seed for people, and his crops were um, infected with GMO seed from Monsanto from a neighbor. And then he was sued uh, for stealing the seed, which he never uh, had any desire to use. He, in fact, ended up having to close down his farm and close down his research because his good seed was contaminated for who knows how many hundreds of years to come. Uh, and so he spent he spends his life now going around the world, uh, warning people about Monsanto, warning people about GMO seed, GMO research, um, and he's liked by some and not liked by others, such as Monsanto. And so we're always being watched. We're, I'm sure uh, he made comments many times while we were traveling and speaking that they know where we are. So um, Also, in the center of the picture, I think you can recognize me, uh, standing next to Oscar Oliveira. 
who is also um, an activist from Cochabamba, Bolivia, fighting for water rights in his community. Um, we did some amazing work and uh, just starting to plant the seeds of um, solidarity between our countries. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, when when you're wanting to uh, start a protest or some kind of an activist movement, you have to take some things into consideration, beginning with getting organized, and it can be a formal organization like the Four Bridges Traveling Permaculture Institute which uh, we do a lot of other things besides activism, but it's good to have a base and a, a, for funding issues and communication and things like that. Um, one of the very most important things to begin with is educating the people. If they don't know what the problem is or the issue is, like GMO labeling, um, they're not going to fight with you. You have to start with education, and it can be simple things like flyers or talks like this. Um, well, we'll talk about more of that um, in the future slides. So. Um, relentless exposure. Just You have to be talking about it all the time to everybody you see and everywhere you go to bring awareness to people of your cause. You got to motivate your supporters. If they're not, um, if they're not into what your cause is, they're not going to help out. You're going to end up with three people showing up at an event. So it's important to get people motivated, um, and then, and then you're ready to start taking action. And we'll talk about what those actions might be in order to affect change. So uh, we spent. Um, a lot of time with Oscar Oliveira. He's been here to our farm and uh, spoke at our conference, which is the um, Traditional Agriculture and Sustainable Living Conference that we hold every year in Española at the Northern New Mexico College. And he was our, one of our main speakers last October. Um, and he talked about their um, revolution, if you want to say, their, their fight against Bechtel and the privatization of water in uh, in Cochabamba, and one of the things, one of the things that he talked about, and I traveled with him all over New Mexico. Besides our conference, he spoke at United World College. He spoke at a couple of places here in Santa Fe. He spoke at UNM, um, and even was on a Native American Calling radio uh, program for an hour. And the one thing that, one of the things that stood out in my mind was how he motivated people or got people excited, and that was just simply with the flag. Um, they went door to door talking to people about their water bills, and this is a, this is a third world country. The water bills were going through the roof, and the people couldn't even had to decide whether they could afford water or food even. And so they went door to door talking about how they were going to fight against this action. And uh, they asked people to hang the Bolivian flag on their door. And so that was the signal for the organizers to tell who knew and who didn't know. And so then they were able to go to doors with no flags and educate people that way. Um, that's just one example. Okay, this is... Um, this is a picture that I took in La Paz, Bolivia, last uh, back in January. This is actually, we were fortunate enough, it wasn't planned this way, to be there on the uh, National Day of Indigenous People. Uh, these are This is the streets of La Paz, and their um, current president is an indigenous person, Evo Morales. And so they organized this huge um, event in the city on that day. The streets were so packed, you couldn't you couldn't move. And these were all people that were trying to see the talk of Ava Morales in the square. We ended up turning around and going back because we were with um, older people and small people and some of the people were worried about um, getting trampled. So, But you can see there's flags there. I don't see, well, far in the distance there's a Bolivian flag, but the checkered flag is the flag of the indigenous people. Anybody recognize this flag? 
not many. This is, um, a lot of people, if they do recognize it, they see it as the flag of the Mohawk people. Um, it was designed by a Mohawk Hawk man um, back in the 90s, Louis Hall, but it now represents um, all indigenous warriors. <coughs> and anybody who's uh, seen anything about the Idol No More that started in the Ottawa area, and you may see things on Facebook or something, you've probably seen that flag because it's everywhere, and that's the flag we're using to, to um, promote unity. Well, that's my son. Uh, this, this, uh, put these next couple of slides is, um, I'm going to talk about occupation at the end, but this was an occupation um, regarding land claims in the Six Nations area of the indigenous people, a town called Caledonia near Toronto in Canada, and um, a construction company decided to develop some of land that was our sacred land and was building buildings and sometimes talk and legislation is slow or ineffective and so it started with just a few uh, clan mothers uh, sitting on that land with signs um, and we'll talk about it a little bit later what it developed into here's a bunch this is the same um, the same uh, struggle here these are this area developed into a place of unity and solidarity. People came showing their support, not just Native people, but uh, Canadians, Americans. There were people from uh, Israel that brought their flags, other nations of indigenous people. And so that was a show to people. And this was the main strip through the town that was taken over and occupied. And so when pe uh, people did see the flags, they realized we weren't alone. Um, we had support. Uh, flags can be displayed in other ways, like blankets. This is the, the flag of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois people, the five, uh, six nations. No. Okay, this is uh, talking a little bit about solidarity, and there's the flag again. Now, during the time of this land claim struggle near Toronto, the native people, um, Iroquois people, all around Canada and New York, uh, stood up in support of what was going on there because what happens to them happens to all of us and th and that's how we should as people inhabitants of the earth if it's happening even in Bolivia with water it's going to someday happen to us so we, if we want to be concerned about our future and our generations we should stand up for what we believe in and share um, in the struggle and so this is Akwazasani Mohawk Reservation in which is a kind of a unique place. It's partly in New York, partly in Canada, partly in the middle of St. Lawrence River. And um, on this particular day, we were not, it was not a roadblock. It was kind of a slow block. <laughs> you have to cross this bridge to either go from Canada to New York or New York to Canada. And they have to go through customs, they have to go through toll booth. And so we were out there passing out flyers telling people about what was going on. And there were a few grouchy people who were late for work um, or were in a hurry, but a lot of people were in support of, of it and glad and brought us coffee and donuts from, you know, from the other side or whatever. So this is the bridge I was talking about. It's called the Three Nations Bridge. Um, Three Nations being. Um, United States, Canada, and the Mohawk Nation, and it's the bridge that uh, connects the U.S. to Canada, and you can see that there's some flags there. It doesn't look too impressive from there, but in real life, if you look at the side of the bridge, you know, a person would be maybe just a little bit taller than that ledge, and so, and the drop is really, really far, far down, and so it took some people to stand up on that and, and connect those flags. This one's really impressive. This is back again at Caledonia um, in, in uh, Ontario with the land claims uh, fight. Uh, this man up here, his name is Michael Laughing and he's an iron worker and that's one of the advantages that the Iroquois people have. We are famous for our iron workers, our um, skywalkers. 
And um, so there was three gentlemen that grabbed our flags and went all the way to the top. So those could be seen for miles and miles and miles. Uh, it shows our, our strength and our perseverance to, to go to those lengths to let people know uh, we're still here. This is a more recent picture. It's in Ottawa, and it has to do with the Occupy, uh, I'm sorry, the um, I Don't Know More um, events that are happening, and there's flags. Again, even the American flag, and I think this might be the Canadian flag, it's hard to tell, but there's flags from different nations of people there, uh, and again, of course, the one that you've been seeing all morning. <coughs> Okay, now we're going to talk about uh, getting your message out to people and the use of signs and banners. Does anybody know the um, the national anthem for Canada? Oh, Canada. It's, oh, Canada, our home, our native land. So we took the words and switched them to make more sense. Oh, Canada, your home on native land. And that was right on the, on the main road. But stop and think where you are, people. Okay. This is, uh, there were just signs all over the place. This one, there were so many no negotiations going back and forth. This was major, major. Um, back in, my son's eight now, and he was not two years old, so. From 2005, maybe, maybe 2006, that this was happening. And construction stopped, and you'll see some pictures um, a little further ahead. Construction stopped. Our people um, occupied those houses. We closed down the roads. Um, we stopped commerce from happening. And um, so there was negotiations going back and forth. And this was just kind of a little message. Well, what's your next move? This land is our land. The use of songs and taking um, you know quotes out of songs to connect with people. And those four-wheelers were driven all over the place for reconnaissance and surveillance and um, trafficking people. Okay. okay, this was back in January in Cusco, Peru. We participated in an event um, also with Percy Smizer there and um, local indigenous people from the Andes Mountains, uh, Quechua and Bolu um, Aymara people against Monsanto and uh, against pesticides. And there was probably 200 people in the street. And the interesting thing about um, Peru uh, and some of these other countries in South America is that even though we stopped the road, we stopped the traffic, everybody was in support of it. There wasn't any people giving us the finger, or yelling at us, get out of the way, beeping horns. The traffic stopped to let us go by. This is in um, Argentina. This was also in January, late January. Um, a, a group of ladies who got together because their town was uh, had a high rate of cancer and other illnesses that was um, attributed to um, crop dusting, pesticides in their area with um, pesticides from Monsanto. And so this uh, sign in Spanish, the sign in Spanish is uh, translated to say, Monsanto don't pretend to make a better world because what they're doing is actually the opposite. And they travel around Argentina telling about their problem, their, what, what's happened, their experience. It's um, a good friend of mine right there, that's David Miracle, and he's um, doing a lot of the organizing of the I Don't Know More stuff that's in the um, Toronto, <coughs> between Toronto and Ottawa area. Uh, he's an amazing artist. He might have even made that sign, but I'm not quite sure. I haven't had a chance to ask. But just using signs to, and the, what, I'm going to talk about this in another minute, but you know, once you have that sign and once you have that image with today's technology and the internet and all that social media, that picture doesn't just reach 10 or 100 or 1,000 people, it reaches millions. So the words that you choose, the images that you choose are really important. 
Okay, your sign can even, you can even wear your sign. Um, this was a recent one in Ottawa also. Um, I told my sister I wanted to do some kind of a shocking uh, demonstration for people today, and she said, well, you can streak. Well, don't worry, that's not going to happen today. <laughs> um, I actually had another thing in mind, but um, we, didn't, we weren't able to get copies. So. so I'm wearing my message, too. And this... Uh, this t-shirt was given to me by Oscar Oliveira when he was here for a conference. It's about water. It's without water. It's in Spanish. Without water, you don't have chicha, which is um, a fermented corn drink. Um, what else does it say? No wine, no tequila, no beer, no rum, no sake. So uh, if water isn't important to you, these, maybe these other things are. Uh, so you can be wearing your message. It costs a little bit of money if you have 50 or 100 people that are gathering someplace, but it makes a big impact when there's a bunch of you out there. Um, it, it gets attention. But it could be as simple as just taking out a marker and writing on an old t-shirt. <coughs> the power of the press and other media. So besides all the other things that I do, I'm a journalist, and um, I've uh, written in the past for... Um, the People's Voice in Akwazasne, and um, I still, on occasion, write for Indian Time, but was uh, a lot more active when I was back home for Indian Time newspaper. Um, and a couple of times a year, I now write for Green Fire Times. I have a big stack of things to write now for the, our experiences in South America. So for me, it's easy to uh, find ways to get the word out in the press. Um, and if you're if you're organizing an event or um, a protest, if if you don't already write, it would help to have a writer on board with you or someone who's involved in the press. Is there anybody from Green Fire Times here today? I thought Seth might be here. Um, this, okay. Well, this is one of my articles. This um, is about global warming and. Uh, a man they call Uncle from uh, Greenland. This story um, was published in Green Fire Times and also in the Indian Time newspaper. Oh, the use of humor. I'll give you a second to read these jokes. This is about um, uh, environmental change, um, and this is kind of uh, if you're if you're. Involved in a struggle now, or you're starting um, to organize something, these are these will be the attitudes that you'll that you'll come across too, uh, in one way or another. And it can be frustrating, but even if you change one person's mind out of a million, it's one more than before. Okay, this is my little plug on against GMOs. And this was the this was the shocking event that we had planned. Um, I was surprised I came in from Santa Cruz this morning and uh, I was going to print this off on my printer but I figured I'd save on ink and go into um, Office Max um, to get the copies made for everybody. Um, and then I was surprised that pretty much nothing opens before 11 in Santa Fe. I went to three different places, four different places. And so here's a simple um, exercise that you can do to get your message out. I, I, I wanted to use the humor part, so it's got the thing about GMOs and, uh, you know, and the attitude of companies like Monsanto. Oh, let's just put it out there and see what happens. And then the message. Um, I don't know more in New Mexico. Insist on GMO labeling for our food, which is a, um, a thing that's happening pretty much all across the country now, but especially here in New Mexico. I'm not up on it yet. I'm still recovering from the fog of my travels, but I, I know I'm going to get back into it um, probably with, as soon as all my writing and everything is done this week. Um, we were going to pass one out to everybody and then hold it up and take a, a photo opportunity to put out on Facebook. 
And then also that you could take with you and make copies. You could either pass these out when you're at an event at the Roundhouse or some other place, or what my kids were going to do is make paper airplanes and throw them at you. Um, that, that could be fun for people, or it could land you in jail, but you kind of have to choose your battles. And, uh, or, uh, you know. So that's the, the message on the thing. You can go through that one. Okay, social networking. So this is, um, Facebook can be a dangerous thing, but it can also be a good thing. Um, I spend, um, I, I, every day, if I'm in an area where I have internet access, I go out there and I share my message to people and, and, and pass other people's messages on. We have um, about 500 friends right now. Um, so Facebook, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, there's a couple of other ones that I haven't been involved with it. That's hard enough. That's like a full-time job just to get your message out on these social networks. But it's so effective. You read that. I mean, I get things every day that's like, wow, I didn't know that was happening. And some of them are crap. You know, it's some sensationalist thing. You have to do the research to make sure that you're trusting what's being passed on. But uh, I trust this. This came from my friend uh, David Miracle, and that's a parliament in Ottawa about the I don't know more. Um, this is another thing that was posted on Facebook. It's here for a couple of reasons. Um, to defend the land, we must defend the, the defenders. Now this can apply to any activist, whether it's land, against GMOs, human rights, women's rights, whatever. People are less apt to uh, take a, an active role if they if they are afraid of uh, what will happen to them. If they know someone's got their back, they're going to maybe take an extra few steps. Um, where I come from, to be arrested fighting for what you believe in is um, a badge of courage. It's funny, when I came back from South America, I had a, an, a warrant for my arrest in the mailbox. And it was about a, it turned out to be about a, a traffic ticket that I had taken care of before I left, but the paperwork got mishandled at the courthouse. And so I was horrified because I thought, I've never been arrested. I mean, I've been lots of places where um, I should have been arrested, but I'm usually with some big burly guy who's the big flag for get him. And so then I'm kind of forgotten. But I, I said to myself, this it's horrifying to have to be arrested for the failure to come to a complete stop at a stop sign and to be fingerprinted and have your picture taken. It didn't happen, but that was my that was my attitude. Well, if I'm going to be arrested, I want it to mean something. So uh, you know, but you have to know that somebody's got your back. That you have you know. Uh, legal aid to help you, that you have people that will show up at court for you. This happens almost every day on our reservations back home, usually about uh, land claims, um, land, land disputes, and uh, human rights issues and stuff, uh, and using the press to get that word out to people, to get people shocked and angered to come in and support. Um, but it takes a really strong and brave person to say, I don't care what happens, this is what I believe in, and I'm going to go all the way with it. Okay, so I started out with more mild things like flags and t-shirts and flyers, but uh, we, our people believe, um, as and do many indigenous people like what happened in Bolivia, is that if you feel strongly enough about it, then you have to take a stronger action. And this is, uh, we use roadblocks a lot. And it could be something that lasts a day. It could be something that lasts 90 days. Um, and like I said before, we have a lot of iron workers and construction people in our, um, in our culture. So this roadblock went up maybe in a few hours. When uh, the word gets out that something's going on, we come out of the woodwork with whatever we've got in our backyard. <coughs> I don't have um, a lot of detailed pictures, but they put up scaffolding, kind of like a toll booth. Um, and behind that, you can see 
uh, a, a big pile of gravel. Mm -hmm. So something as simple as it's not destructive. It stops you from getting through, but once we ha get our message out or we uh, win our battle, it can be easily scooped up and taken away again. This one's a little more drastic. Um, this is um, this is again in Caledonia about the the um, the land dispute. Uh, when you take over someone's sacred land where their ancestors are buried, people get pissed off. Um, and so they cut down the telephone poles and threw them across the road. This road would be like 599 going around Santa Fe uh, to get people from one town to another to go to work, to get groceries, to buy your furniture, clothes, whatever. Um, we do this to wake people up. If it's not in your living room, if it's not in your backyard, maybe you don't care. But when you can't get groceries or you can't get to work, you can't pick up your paycheck. You're going to start. You can't get your product to market. When it's about money, you're going to stop and listen. Okay, these are a bunch of images. There's there's a <coughs> a message on the road there. That's the Iroquois flag, and I think it says "Our land" or "Our home" uh, painted in the middle of the road. This one is railroad ties blocking um, the other way around town. Um, that took a little more work. They're very neatly stacked one by one by one. Um, the one up in the corner looks really drastic, but it was actually a mistake. They were trying to push um, old, broken down cars into the road to block it, and this fell off the overpass and <laughs> exploded everywhere. So, um, And then I have this railroad track, which uh, it doesn't really show anything happening, but we typically will block a railroad track. Uh, track to keep the trains from going through, to keep the people from going where they want to go, or the products from going to market, to you know, to get some attention. Okay, this is probably one of the most drastic forms of uh, protest occupation. Um, but uh, the non-native people have really uh, learned from us and started to to use this tactic also. And it can be in a nonviolent way. Really, we always try it for it to be in a nonviolent way. It's how the government reacts that changes the, the, uh, the attitude of the, the occupation. This is a really famous picture. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it before. It's, um, well, we know it's a Mohawk man. We don't know who, against the uh, provincial police um, on the other side in a, a struggle back in 1990 about our, our land. Um, there was uh, some sacred land being dug up to build a golf course. Another thing that Native people are not really thrilled about, it's not really our sport. Um, <laughs> and it's a whole bunch of land wasted, a whole bunch of water wasted to um, push a little ball around into a hole. <laughs> and so we got pissed off. And this struggle went on for 90 days. We blocked the bridges going between Canada and New York and Canada and Vermont. Um, people were hurt. Bad things happened. But we got our message through. And as in um, other struggles in the past, when one uh, Native nation is in, in turmoil, the others um, follow suit and... Um, and get our back. Yeah. Okay, this is back to the Caledonia thing. These are some of the construction sites. This one's, some of them were almost complete, some of the houses, by the time we um, organized enough to, to occupy the land. And we, we did win. Um, we took over these houses and used them for, um, for the struggle. People slept in them. We used them for offices. We used them for information dissemination, um, lots of storage of food and things. And because of our construction and iron worker background, I saw this building go up in, I don't know, two hours? This was the cook shack in the middle of a road. They literally, eight or ten men came with a bunch of lumber and nails and power tools and it was there, and that's where we prepared food for 
for people who were there for the duration, people who came for two or three days, people who came for a few hours. My role in this occupation was mainly through the press. And I, did, I went back and forth. This was near Six Nations um, Reservation. And I was living at the time in Akwazasne. It's about a six-hour drive and had a big van. So whenever I'd go back to... Um, I'd go back home, and I had kids at home that I had to, you know, they were with their dad, but I, you know, had to be with them. Uh, but every time I made a trip back, about once a week, everybody loaded me down with um, food, clothes, blankets, um, nothing illegal. Um, and newspapers, stacks and stacks of newspapers. So whatever article I wrote went out that week, and then we disseminated those newspapers to everybody there to... To, to give them that encouragement that, yeah, this is really happening, people know about it, and, and we're, we're working, it's making a difference. Um, the Canadian Customs got wind of it after a while, and every time I went through the Customs, they literally took my van apart, opened the, um, the I don't know, the thing that's on the door, Side panels. Yeah, side panels. Opened the hood, looked under cameras. They took me out of the car, <coughs> searched me. They tried, and they never could find anything illegal to keep me from going through. But it was just, and that happened even for a year after that. They just, I, I got marked as a troublemaker, um, which was kind of fun, <laughs> and nothing so minor as not stopping for ten seconds at a stop sign. I put this picture in here, this is a recent one too in Ottawa, that sometimes you have to be prepared for, um, for adversity. It might snow, it might rain, it might get cold. you got to make sure you got food and water, depending on the length of whatever your, um, your protest is um, going to happen. Clothes, blankets, coats, first aid, be prepared. And here's the railroad tracks, so... This is uh, my friend Ray Cook, who is also in uh, Native Media. He was one of the founders of um, Akwazasne Notes. I know a lot of people out here have heard of Akwazasne Notes, which became the Indian Time newspaper. He does a, a Native radio talk show. And so I asked, told him why I was doing this talk, and I said, do you have anything to say? And he said, use this picture and these words. And it's a good image to project, you know. Think before you do the next thing, because we'll be there. And those people won't move. The train will have to stop. Or not. Okay. So I really like this phrase. I, I use it a lot. And um, I don't know if everybody recognizes these images, but they're both from Wounded Knee, yeah. about 100 years apart. Yeah. It's um, Bigfoot, frozen, death, dead in the snow. Day after Christmas. And... Uh, about a hundred years later, Russell Means and, um, and AIM, American Indian Movement. So what do you do after you've, you've done your, your activist work and you've either won your battle or maybe it didn't have the greatest outcome? You still tell everybody about it. You do your documentary. This uh, Ganasadage Oka, that's the one, the 1990... I have some pictures of. They did a, a really good documentary on that. Um, John Trudeau, who was part of the, um, the Wounded Knee uh, problems back in the 70s. Uh, he's got a bit, so many people. I just had to put a few out there to get the idea out. But the one in the center, Tambien La Lluvia, Even the Rain, that's from my friend Oscar Oliveira, and it's talking about the water wars in Cochabamba, Bolivia. And um, his sister is coming into New York in about 10 days. She's bringing me 20 copies of this. I don't have any to sell today, but if anybody's interested in learning more about how um, big business is trying to um, privatize our water, they, the, even the rain, they weren't, it was illegal to collect the rain on your own property. And they're talking about that in California and other places, too. So 
don't wait for it to happen. Let's find out about it and see what we can do to stop it. So anybody who's interested, I'm taking a, um, taking orders for the for his movie. Also incentivizing. <laughs> write a book, or if you can't write, have want someone write for you or with you. Uh, there's Oscar's book, um, Cochabamba. Uh, Water Rebellion in Bolivia, and it's in is published in Spanish and English and maybe other languages by now too. He wrote it with somebody else. This man um, was just a high school graduate who um, made shoes in a factory, and now he's uh, he was invited by Evo Morales to be uh, in his cabinet, and he turned it down because he said when you when you when you join big government, you change your values and um, you become a part of the, the problem and not the solution. And so he's turned him down, his offer down at least twice. Um, so yeah, tell your story. Malcolm X, the future belongs to those who prepare for it today. Always be thinking about What's what's in the works ahead, and, and is it good for us or not so good for us? So this is just a bunch of things that are going on, you know, that are affecting us today, and, and I'm just uh, giving you the encouragement to choose your battle and get involved. And my final thought, I, I've got this on Facebook, too. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So that's pretty much all that I have to say. I don't know how much time I used up, but um, uh, if anybody wants to know more about the work that I do, or if they want to know about Four Bridges Traveling Permaculture Institute, we're in Santa Cruz, New Mexico. Um, we, Besides our educational farm, we do um, educational events around the state and around the world, really. Um, we have a website, I have cards, I have a few uh, <coughs> newsletters left over. Um, What's your website? Have, it's www4, the number 4, bridges.org. And, uh, yeah. Thank you.